I'd like to start today by reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Apostle Paul is the speaker, and he writes, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Father, as we look into the word today, give us understanding of how to apply it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is um, the final message, message number 12 in our series on the fruit of the Spirit. And looking back on what we've studied, we have we started the series uh with a couple of weeks of necessary instruction so that we could see the why of Paul's writing this letter to the Galatian church. And it was written by the apostle because he had heard some devastating news of something that had occurred after he and Barnabas had left the region of Galatia after preaching to the people the unfathomable riches of Christ. You see, at first, the results of his preaching was that many people in Galatia believed in what they were hearing from him, that Christ had come and taken their sins by dying on the cross and rising again, and, and they were saved. Um, and, and thus they were added to the church, to the overall universal church. But then came the news that Paul heard that false teachers had come in after Paul and Barnabas had left, and they deceived the people by saying that Paul's teaching did not go far enough. They said that if the Galatians truly wanted to be saved, they also needed to observe the Jewish law. But they, what they were telling the Galatians was an outright lie. In Paul's letter to these new believers, he pointed out that if they thought the law, including the Ten Commandments and all the other 600 plus Jewish laws that came along with it, would, would play any part in saving them, Christ would profit them nothing. And Paul made this very clear. He said in uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 4, Paul said, Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now, understand what Paul is saying. First, he brings up circumcision. What was that all about? Well, the circumcision of all Jewish male babies had been a necessary thing, for it was part of keeping the law of Moses. But when Christ came, and, and that, that law, also known as the Levitical law, was finally fulfilled with his coming. No more animal sacrifices were needed to cover sin, because the final and perfect sacrifice for the ages had come, that being Christ himself. When Jesus, the Son of God, died on that cross, that was it. That was the final propitiation, the, the final fully satisfactory sacrifice for sin that God would accept. No more keeping of the Jewish law was necessary. So if a person decided to be circumcised as part of something that he had to do to be saved, he totally missed the point of the cross. Christ alone saves. And when you add something, anything, to the finished work on the cross that he alone did, you lose it all. All his benefits, you lose. You may, uh, it may look very spiritual to some people to, that, that some get circumcised. It may look good to those on the outside. Obviously, we're, we're talking about men for circumcision, but women too, they don't get circumcised, but they can do good works trying to be saved. They can give money trying to be saved. Any of those kind of things, they may look good on the outside, but all of it, so far as salvation is concerned, is fool's gold. Fool's gold. Christ put, uh, Christ plus nothing else equals salvation. In other words, he doesn't need and he doesn't want our help. 
Christ plus anything else equals a lost soul who still doesn't get it. For God will not share his glory with another. Not with your good works, not with your money, not with your anything. This is the overarching reason for the book of Galatians that it, that it was written to make it abundantly clear that we don't need to keep the law to save us from our sins. All we need is Christ. And indeed, if we did need to keep the law to save us, every person would be forever lost in sin. Because even the best human being in history uh, of the planet has, has had times of not keeping the law in all its fullness. You see, one break and it's over. That's all it takes to be lost forever. But some may push back on this a little bit. Some may say, but if we don't have to have to keep the law of God, won't people take advantage of that and just do whatever they want? Won't they let themselves go and sin? <laughs> the answer is no. Why not? Because the person who trusts in Jesus Christ for their salvation, the, the moment that that happens, he or her receives the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit puts into the heart of the new believer a desire to, to do the will of God, a desire to live holy before him. Now look with me at Galatians 5, verse 18. Paul says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Do you see the lesson here? When you receive the Holy Spirit, he, he leads. You are directed uh, by him as he takes up residence in your heart and your soul and your spirit. And so you begin to want to do the right things, not because of outward laws, but because God is directing you from the inside. He is directing your heart, your loves, your desires. And you know what? It actually works. It actually works. Do you know what Jesus said to his disciples right before he ascended into heaven? In Acts chapter 9, or uh, chapter 1, verse 8, he said, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall receive power. You see, receiving Christ for salvation means that you also receive the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. And so, and receiving the Holy Spirit means that you receive power to live the way that God wants you to live, not by following a law that says you have to do it, no, but by following the one who guides you into all truth, God himself, the third person of the Trinity. Now, this does not mean there won't be lapses. In Galatians 5, verses 5 uh, verse 16, Paul writes, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for flesh lusts against the spirit and spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish now the reason that we sin that we is that we now have, as a as a believers we have two natures the old nature did not disappear when you came to trust in christ you know what it's still there and as Paul wrote, flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. They don't coexist nicely. And if we only obeyed the flesh, whew, can you imagine what our lives would look like? They'd look pretty rotten. And um, look how bad it would be if we did not have the Holy Spirit guarding us, guiding us. Look at verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5. Paul writes, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. This is descriptive of every person who is controlled by the flesh and not the spirit of God. Indeed, look, look at the rest of verse 21. He says, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. When a person's life is characterized by mostly evil, okay, and when I say that, I mean selfishness, 
Uh, I mean, the way they may use the Lord's name in vain, just a, 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 a number of things that they do over and over. It's a sign that God's spirit does not live within. And that person has not placed their trust in Christ. And this, this could be anyway. It doesn't matter if they were baptized or if they made a public confession of faith. I, I baptized a lot of people, especially years ago when I was a full-time pastor in Angelica. And I, I baptized one boy who was probably about seven years old. Um, give or take a, a, a few years. And so this was many, many years ago. He's now in his 30s. And he's not walking with the Lord. He's never really walked with the Lord. I had a conversation with his mother who's convinced that he's saved because he was baptized and because he made a profession of faith. You know what? That's not the way it works. Because those things might not be real. Somebody can be baptized and not be saved. Somebody can make a confession of faith and it not not really mean it. Maybe they didn't even understand what it meant at the time. If there is zero fruit of, of righteousness, there's no salvation. When there's a, a no desire to grow holy, there's reason to believe that such a person remains unregenerated, unsaved. But then we get a great contrast in the next two verses, the verses that we started out in. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. Now, we've studied these nine facets of the godly fruit. And this is what God wants his people to look like. Have you seen growth in toward these the, this high and holy standard in your life over the past year, over the past five years, over the past 20 years, if you've been saved that long? In the short run, we, we have our ups and downs, don't we? But we may have, and we may have seasons where we're chasing the lust of the flesh and falling into some of those things that Paul mentions in verses 19 through 21. But the overall tenor of our lives should be toward the good things that we see in verses 22 and 23. Now, um, let's look now at the very end of it it says look at look because there's one part of this short passage in our 11 weeks that we have yet to study the first 11 weeks the last few words of verse 23 you see them let's look at now it says against such there is no law what does that mean let's look at it now against such there is no law now Let's start by pointing out that there are a lot of laws in this world, a lot of laws in every culture and nation. Most of the time, laws are put in place to govern bad behavior. If we go through the list of works of the flesh that we read in verses 19 through 21, we can point out numerous places where laws were written to restrain people from doing things that can harm themselves and or others. Now, just look at the list. And I put some of them in red just to make it a little bit easier. There used to be laws with real teeth in them against adultery and fornication. Now, those types of laws are pretty much a thing of the past and in our increasingly paganized land today but even today you can get uh lewdness uh lewd behavior can get you a few nights in jail murder can get you uh put away for years or even lead to the death penalty drunkenness can, can, can get you in trouble with the law but if you get caught driving drunk or get into an accident while drunk especially if somebody gets hurt you can be in serious trouble there are laws against it against such and and all the other things that these uh, that these verses these three verses teach may not be um laws per se they may not have laws that were written for them per se but any of these sins could lead to any number of broken laws the government has has to legislate against bad behavior and i think we can all acknowledge that the government doesn't always do a lot of things well but at least they do to a certain degree work for our safety now compare these things to the fruit of the spirit against those there's no law there's no law what what does this tell us it it tells us you don't need to be protected from somebody who's showing love 
You don't need to be protected from somebody who has a spirit of joy or, joy or walking in peace. You don't have to be safeguarded from a person who's showing patience or kindness or goodness. You don't need to be shielded from somebody who walks with faithfulness, somebody who lives with gentleness or with self-control. Against such, there is no law. I think a wonderful example of how to display uh, this godly fruit and, and how it can impact others around us can, can be seen in the life of the one who wrote about it, the Apostle Paul himself. Have you ever studied Paul's trip to Rome? You see, Paul had long wanted to go to Rome so that he could preach the gospel. In Romans 1.11, he says to us, uh, he says to the Romans in his letter, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. So he wanted to go. Verse 13, now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. You see, for years, Paul had wanted to uh, go to Rome and preach the, the gospel. And he finally did get there, but not the way that he anticipated. Paul had been on previous missionary journeys, and he had gone from city to city as the Spirit led him. But he went to Rome as a prisoner where a legal case that the Jewish leaders, religious leaders had brought against him could be tried in front of Caesar. And so Paul was taken there as a prisoner of Rome, and he was brought upon sh a ship for the trip. But that journey turned out to be a harrowing time. You can read about it in its fullness in Acts 27 and 28. The amazing thing is that Paul, who was a prisoner, just by living out his life uh, among the people on that journey, he ended up being viewed more as a leader than a captive. Let's take a look. Look at Acts 27 with me, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> And it says, and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julian, Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of Adriatum, we sit put to sea, meaning to sail along the coasts of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. Now, here the journey begins. And Paul is put into the hands of a Roman centurion named Julius. Now, centurions were the most elite troops in the Roman Empire. They were the leaders. They were the most experienced, the ones uh, who, who had distinguished themselves in battle by fighting with valor and ferocity. And they understood how to carry out orders. You can believe that. And they were able to hand out punishment, even the death penalty to their own legionnaire soldiers when necessary, if those soldiers neglected to follow orders. Paul was under the watchful eye of such a man. You can be certain that Julius would not allow this apostle to escape, especially because Paul was a high, high profile prisoner. Now look at verse three. And the next day, we landed at Sidon, and Julius, the centurion, treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Now, don't miss this. This centurion, Julius, a highly experienced man of war, a leader in the mighty Roman Empire, treated Paul kindly. Why? And it says here that he gave him liberty to go to his friends. Did you get that? Why would this guy trust Paul? This had all the earmarks of not ending well for, for Julius. Wouldn't you agree? This sounds more like a, a Hogan's Heroes episode with, with Sergeant Schultz leading the prisoners than a centurion from Rome. Now, Paul, Paul was not Julius's only prisoner, by the way. We're told in verse 1 that, that there were other prisoners in this group. And I think that we can be pretty certain that uh, he did not allow any other prisoners to be with their friends. It's just go be with your friends. No, no, that didn't happen. But there was something about Paul. 
something trustworthy, something that gave Julius a sense that this man was different, not only from all the other prisoners, but maybe from just about anybody he had ever known. Now, I know I'm reading a bit into the scripture here, but it is not every day that an, an elite soldier from one of the greatest armies in history gives a prisoner a day pass to go and be with his friends. And this is exactly what Julius did. He trusted that Paul was going to return. Now, look what happened. Acts 27 Verse 4, when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Now, Luke is the writer here, writing in the first person. So he says we. He was one of Paul's companions. And, and he notes by with the we that Paul came back. And Julius had, had fully expected he would. And so they continued their journey to Rome. Verse 5, and when Paul, it says, and when, and when we had sailed over the sea uh, to uh, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of uh, Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and put us on board. Now the trip continues and they switched boats because there's, there, was, there were not express cruises to Rome for prisoners back then. We're going to roll down to verse 9 now. It says... Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the feast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, opening toward the southwest and northwest, and winter there. Now, what, what I want you to see here is that on this ship, a boat that was carrying prisoners and property, and by the way, many other passengers, Paul was a prisoner. And he, but he was hardly treated like one. He was up on deck. He was advising the powers that be the, the best way to move forward on this trip. Did you catch that? How often is it that soldiers and leaders are going to consider the, the, the words of a, of a prisoner? I mean, what, what was Paul even doing up on deck talking with the powers that be? Why wasn't he in some galley down below with the other prisoners chained together with them? Clearly, he wasn't being treated as a prisoner. Julius was still treating him with kindness. Why? Was Julius just some super kind kind of guy? <laughs> That's doubtful. Rather, he recognized, Julius did, something good in Paul. And over and over again, Paul confirmed it to be true. Now, understand that this trip was taking place in October. We know that because in verse 9, it tells us that the fast was already over. Now, this is speaking about Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, the fast. And that takes place in late September or early October. And, and this is a, a dangerous time to travel in that region that these men were making the trip because of the change of seasons. The weather could get really difficult very quickly, and it could stay that way for a while. And that's what happened. Paul understood this, and he advised the men that they ought not to travel. Now, did they listen to him? No, they didn't. Look at verse 11. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than the things spoken of by Paul. Now, it's not that Julius didn't listen to Paul. It looks like he did. It sounds like he may have considered the apostle's words. But Paul wasn't a professional sailor. And when the owner of the ship and the helmsman who would be leading the trip said they could make it happen, what's Julius going to do? He went along with them on this. It's understandable. It was also a big mistake. Verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocliden. 
So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the, ship, the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it aboard, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run a, a ground on the, the Sirtis sands, they struck sail so that they were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. And so this is quite a, a difficult trip. They did everything they could do to lighten the ship. And by the way, in a later uh, account that we'll read in a little bit, we're told that there were 276 people on this visit, this vessel. That's a lot of lives at stake here. So let's read on. Verse 20, 21. And after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God of who, to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So again, where is the Apostle Paul found? He's found in the midst of the leaders, not in the prisoners' quarters, trained on, chained to a pole. He was up there calmly and gently rebuking the powers that be. Can you believe this? Telling him, you, you shouldn't have gone. You should have listened to me. And then he shared some news that everybody needed to hear. And that was, everything is going to be okay. Just hang in there. The ship is going to be destroyed. Sorry about that. We, but we will all survive. Now, how did Paul know? Well, he says, because an angel told him. Do you think anyone was making fun of Paul's words or doubting him? I don't think so. This was a man who spoke with power, yet with gentleness, which, by the way, is a, uh, a fruit of the Spirit. A man who spoke with a spirit of love, which is a fruit of the spirit. In the, and in the midst of it all, he had peace in his heart and he had joy. Two more fruits of the spirit. A man who was faithful to his God. Faithfulness is a fruit of the spirit. A man who could be trusted. Even by a, a rough and rugged Roman centurion. Now, let's read on. Verse 33. And as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them to take all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from your head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Oh, I just love this part. This happened just as it was clear that the boat was getting into shallow water, but it was still far enough out to sea that the threat of, of, of death from drowning was very real. And remember that no one had eaten anything in many days due to the condition of the waves, apparently for two weeks. Don't you love Paul's boldness? His witness was ever present to everyone in the boat, and his lack of fear was evident as well. The fruit of the Spirit that the apostle displayed before these people who were his captors was just nothing short of amazing. And you would wonder who the real captain was. <laughs> And who was really the lead guard of this report, if you didn't know the characters? Of course, we we do, but but you would wonder. Now, in verse, so that was verse 35, verse 36. And they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. And they were, and in all, there were, we, we were 276 persons on the ship. So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw the wheat out into the sea. Everyone 
the centurion, the other soldiers, presumably the ship's owner, the helmsman, they all followed this prisoner's example <laughs> and ate the prisoner's example. My friends, when you know who you really are in Christ, when you are unafraid to let your light shine before men, it becomes powerful. People believe. And the result was all 276 people on that ship, a ship that, that was about to crash against the rocks and be destroyed, every one of them made it to shore safely. What's the point here? Dr. Luke, the writer of these words, did not ex explicitly say it, but the narrative bears it out. The fruit of the, of the Spirit was displayed in the apostle in such a way that unregenerated men could see it. They could see that this man was different, that he was trustworthy, that he knew things, <laughs> that he had an in with God that they themselves did not have. And so they trusted him and they followed his example. We don't have an account of what happened to all these people after this trip was over. But I can only believe the number of them were totally changed but why, by what went on. And, and, with, and, and some of them likely came to trust in God, the God that Paul followed. They came to know Christ they, because Paul bore witness to the power of Christ who worked so mightily in him and through him. My friends, this is the power of growing in Christ. This is the power of desiring and seeking to grow in the production of the fruit of the Spirit for each one of us. Is that happening in you? What is your strong suit? Is it love, joy, or peace? Is it maybe kindness, patience, kindness, goodness? Could it be faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? And what is your weakest one among these as well? Don't be content. Work on that weak suit. Let's work with God's spirit and be the difference maker that this world needs us to be.